Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Invest in San Diego Families Virtual Action Budget Training. My name is Judy, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'll be co-moderating tonight's event alongside Aniata from Mid-City Can, Angelina, and Blair from CPI. Please continue to share your names, pronouns, and the reason why you're here tonight in the chat box. And I see lots of familiar names here, so I'm very happy to see my friends read my emails. <laughs> um, thank you all for being here. We really appreciate you. Awesome. And we are, we're truly so grateful to be in the space with you all and excited to share vital information on the importance of our county budget and how we can all play a role in transforming our community. And even though we are meeting virtually, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the land of the Kumeyaay people and we honor the original ancestors of this land and we strive to be accountable by acknowledging this history and cultivating respect for indigenous people and their land. If you have any questions at all during this presentation, please use the Q&A box. And when using the chat box, make sure that you click all panelists and attendees. And so we have a few things on our agenda for this evening, starting with the history of the Invest in San Diego Families Coalition and our county, the changing county landscape, post-election cycle, um, the Invest in San Diego Families and the new Board of Supervisors that were just recently elected, and then lastly, some upcoming opportunities on how you all can get involved and help us. And now I'm going to hand it back to Ariana, who will be doing our first exercise with us. Thank you, Judy. Hi, everyone. Um, Let's see. So if you are able to, um, please grab your phone and open up your browser. Um, you also have the option of um, using the QR code on the screen. Um, this QR code will actually take you to the website uh, menti.com. So if you open up your browser, go to menti.com and use the code um, 7057 for, I'm sorry, 7057-7430. Um, once you are on the browser, um, and we are actually asking folks a question. So if you could share what are the issues that you care about in your community, we want to get a feel of where everyone's at, um, what are the issues that you all care about. And then the instructions will also be available in the chat. Thank you, Josh, for providing that. So we'll take a couple of um, we'll just take a couple of seconds um, so that folks can share um, their issues that they care about, and then this will actually blow up into a big horde cloud. So again, if you could visit uh, menti.com with the code seventy fifty seven seventy four thirty. And like really think about the things that are bothering you and the things that impact your life or even someone that you care about. There's lots of things um, going on in our community that really need to be addressed. Well, the biggest one so far looks to be housing. Mm -hmm mental health, environmental justice, economic, economic justice. justice. What about the tiny ones, Ariana? I'm seeing supporting immigrants, affordable housing, healthcare, sustainability, police abolition, food access, security, racial justice. Defund, decarcerate, police oversight, Rent relief, lots of good ones in here, y'all. Thank you. I personally put housing because minus this year, since I moved here eight years ago, I've had to move every single summer because of my rent going up. 
And the only reason why it's not going up that much this year is because there's a restriction in place because of COVID. Um, so I definitely cared very deeply about housing um, and would really like to see this issue improve over the years. And maybe y'all can help us improve this issue with the county. Also, if you're not able to access Menti, um, feel free to sh share on the chat. Um, I see rent control now, Marlia. A lot of shared issues here. Police oversight. Living wages. Defund, decarcerate. And does anyone want to share any personal stories or um, reasons why they put um, these specific things in the mentee? Mm. Adina said, would love if they would stop waiving the affordable housing requirements and new developments. I know that's a huge problem. Well, we'll give folks another minute to share any stories or um, reasons why they put these words and then we'll move on to the rest of our presentation. Too many people being evicted during a pandemic. Absolutely. I don't know if anyone from here is from Hillcrest. Um, I live in Hillcrest and I personally feel like, especially last year, I started seeing more folks um, parking their cars and sleeping in their cars. Um, a lot more younger faces too, um, waiting by um, one of the corner stores by my place. So um, it's, it's, it's been real, it's been very heavy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, before MCC, I was actually working with direct services and um, the biggest challenge a lot of our folks um, have is finding affordable housing and keeping that affordable housing. And I think um, a lot of the times we hear our families or friends like moving out like more east because we're not able to afford to stay in the city of San Diego. So housing is such a big issue. Um, environmental justice. So Cipriano shares that data shows that we have concentrated environmental impacts on community and health factors. That's very true. I think um, EHC is a big organization that works on that. It's too expensive to live here. The sheriff lies about deaths in custody. So there's a need of like oversight, but there's also a need to move away from incarcerating people. Like how do we care for community members um, during moments of crisis, right? But thank you all for sharing. Um, one more comment that I see from Blair, workers taking advantage of, and it's so expensive to live here that the employers have so much power. Thank you all there's for one, sharing. I think there's one more, Ariana. Increase in police budgets despite overwhelming public opposition. I'm concerned about how we see justice in our communities. Absolutely. Um, thank you all so much. And we definitely do cover a lot of these issues in the coalition. So definitely stick around to learn more. Thank you all. All right, so moving on. So. Um, what is or who is the Invest in San Diego Families Coalition? So the Invest in San Diego Families Coalition or ISDF um, is a coalition of community, labor and faith-based organizations that work together to advocate for a county where all San Diegans can thrive and have quality lives. And I will read off our partners because I see many of them have logged in tonight, thank you. We have ACE, we have the ACLU of San Diego and Imperial Counties Business for Good, 
Chicano Federation. If I'm mentioning any of you, please um, shout out your name in the chat. We have CPI, of course, our main host, um, ERC, EHC. We have Mass Pace, Mid City Can, Pillars of the Community, Planned Parenthood of the Pacific Southwest, that's where I'm from, San Diego Hunger Coalition, San Diego LGBT Center, and SDOP, SEIU Local 221, and we have Youth Will. So thank you all for being here. Shout out to all my partners. And our partners represent different facets um, of our issues, and we all strive to uplift and advocate for the residents of our community, whether it's civil rights, environmental justice, reproductive health care, or providing legal services and resources for tenants. Our coalition brings together different voices to organize for social justice causes. And the lived experiences we share make this work incredibly powerful and moving at times especially when I personally have a chance to hear my coalition members share their stories during public comment. Um, it, it's really remarkable. And sometimes I call into meetings and I hear people's stories that I've never heard of and I have to fight back crying because it's, it's real. Um, and it's very, um, it's effective to tell stories but it always feels um, very personal but very grateful to hear those stories at all times. Um, but that's our coalition. And with that, um, we're gonna launch our first poll for the night. So Ariana, uh, take it away and let's do our first poll. So our first poll is a simple question. What is the, the county responsible for? So you should have the poll pop up now. Thank you, Jessica. Um, this is just for us to get an idea of what y'all know. I know that I've, you know, been out there canvassing in the past, asked folks, you know, what is it the county does? Um, what do you think it does? What should it continue to do? Um, so we just want to have an idea. Um, There's no right or wrong, wrong question. Um, we just want to have an idea of where everyone's at. If you want to take a minute. Okay, I think that should be enough time. Um, we can go ahead and see the results. Wow. Okay, so we did see, um, you know, a lot of folks vote for all of the above. So a lot of folks do think that the county is responsible for mental health services, housing, public safety, public health and COVID responses. Um, we had a couple of folks um, that did vote for just housing or public safety or public health. And Angelina will actually be going more into um, the responsibilities of the county. But thank you all for participating. Thank you all so much. And great job in answering the first question, right? Um, so why the county? So the county government plays a big role in people's lives. And most of us don't really think about them. And why would we? We have our own lives to live. We're out here worrying about the rent and how high it is. So um, a lot of us don't even have the time to think about what's going on in the county government. However, many of us do pay attention to what's going on in the federal government, like the president and our Congress. And it was really um, hard to ignore what was going on with the president that we just recently had for the past four years. Um, but the county has power and for decades, we have not been able to shift policies due to former leadership. And San Diego County is the second largest county in the state. And we're the fifth largest uh, county in the country based on our population. So we have a lot of power here and our county serves a lot of people. And really the main responsibilities for the county are um, a few major things. And the first is transportation health, public safety, education, elections, and jobs. And the county provides things such as Section 8 housing vouchers, um, foster care services, 
But most notably in the news, you'll probably see um, Chair Nathan Fletcher's press conferences and Vice Chair Nora Vargas's um, press conferences with the pandemic response. That's also included in their lines of duties. And the county is also responsible for um, being responsible for unincorporated areas. And we actually do have several in our county that um, don't belong to a city. So the county has to step in and provide services um, like road maintenance um, and sewer system maintenance. And I don't know if y'all know this, but <laughs> in different parts of the county, we have lots of issues with our roads, um, especially um, with transportation. I don't think that's a secret of either a city or our state. But in general, um, our county is very powerful. They're serving up to 3.3 million people with a budget of over $7 billion and a workforce of over 18,000 employees. There are a lot of county resources available and a lot of county responsibilities. And that creates a lot of opportunities for advocacy on how the county can use these resources and better execute its responsibilities and as well as connecting people with the right resources like rent relief, income replacement, and more. A lot of county programs in general for decades um, have gone underused because of something simple like not reaching out to the right person that could possibly need this service. Um, and that's hopefully going to change with this new uh, county. They have mentioned this, this is a problem that they wanna fix. So hopefully um, we can see in the near future uh, more publicity and more um, accessible information on these funded programs that are supposed to help the residents that live here. But let's go back to recent history with um, San Diego. So we just learned that the county is responsible for providing so many critical community services and programs. However, historically, our county board of supervisors, which is made up of five elected officials who are in charge of running the county and allocating budget resources, has been dominated by really conservative people. And for a long time, San Diego County did not have term limits. So this meant that the same supervisors could run again and again, which they did. And before recent elections in the past few years, most of the county supervisors had been in their positions for over 20 years. Some of them before this uh, recent election were here before a lot of us were born. Um, so clearly that's a problem for many reasons, but these individuals were not interested in spending county funds to ensure San Diegans had access to important programs and services. And instead, these conservative supervisors maintained a status quo or a way of operating that essentially starved county services and failed to ensure our government had the proper culture and infrastructure in place to be able to support San Diego communities. And just adding insult to injury, this particular board, um, especially one of them or two of them really aligned themselves with our former president and demonized undocumented people, demonized refugees, um, amongst other things that they had going on. And we also, the coalition fought to have um, evening board hearings for the budgets. We used to have um, just morning, a, a, just a morning budget hearing, but now we have an opportunity to participate in a morning session or an evening session. And the last board voted in 2018 to not have an evening session and not consider people who had to work a traditional nine to five schedule or who knows, had two jobs, three jobs, but they didn't want to have accessible meetings in the evening, but now we do. And that's something that the coalition fought for. And in 2010, um, progressive groups in San Diego were able to put a measure on the ballot that passed that did create term limits for county supervisors. And this meant that in the following years, there would be opportunities for new leadership that might be willing to make different decisions. And this is really the environment that the Invest in San Diego Families Coalition was formed in and in response to. We knew that such powerful conservative forces, we would need to have a united voice. And we wanted to make sure that we took full advantage 
of this upcoming opportunity to ensure our community's needs are represented in local government. So if you have any thoughts or feelings or questions, please feel free to put it in the chat. If you have a specific question, you can also use the Q&A box. But with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Ariana to do our next poll question. Thank you, Judy. Um, so we have a second poll. We just kind of want to do a vibe check to see where you all at or how do you feel. Um, the question is, if you feel, do you feel the county has prioritized your community in the past? Um, so we went through the history. Um, yeah, and this is, there's no wrong answer. Um, we just want to know how y'all have been feeling about the county and the priorities they have been moving forward with in the past. So we'll just keep it a couple of seconds. And if you're not able to access the poll, um, feel free to sh um, share on the chat, in the chat. I think we can share the results now. Thank you. So folks said no, and others said, oh no. And then some folks said that the county can do better. Um, so as you can all see, I think we're all in a very similar space um, where we don't feel that the county has prioritized our community in the past and that they can proactively do a better job. So we will actually be transitioning um, to Angelina, who is gonna share more about our advocacy and how you can get involved. Um, and it's gonna be a, a very important piece to it. Thank you for sharing. Thanks, Ariana. Hi everyone, I'm Angelina Corsani from the Center on Policy Initiatives um, and with the ISDF. I'm gonna to talk to you all today about our advocacy as a coalition, which some of you all have been a, a really important part of, some of our major highlights in WINS and how ISDF organizing and community efforts have helped create the opportunities that we have now and will have in the upcoming years. So since ISDF started, our coalition has done a lot of work to learn more about the county, bring more attention to the county and its budget, and engage community members in the county and its decision-making processes. For decades, the county had been controlled by a conservative board of supervisors who, like Judy explained earlier, did not represent our residents, especially when it came to values. Even though the board was stacked against us, we knew this would change and that our organizations and communities needed to get ready to move our priorities. So, before this year, even with the challenges we faced and with just one progressive ally on our board who only started in 2018, which was a couple years after our coalition formed, we were still able to push for changes and win. We have seen massive narrative shifts, which means changing the way that people talk about the county and more media coverage of the county and its budget and overall, compared to a few years ago, so many more people are talking and thinking about the county and the issues that our coalition has brought up are a big part of those discussions. One of our biggest examples of this was bringing attention to the county reserves and pushing a back against this narrative that the county doesn't have enough money, which used to dominate budget conversations. And this narrative shift came with a real win. Since 2018, $75 million has been moved out of county reserves and into a fund that is dedicated to building more affordable housing. 
We've also seen unprecedented engagement in the county budget. Um, another thing Judy mentioned was us winning an evening budget hearing so that people could have a chance to give input in the budget outside of regular working hours. The year before the first evening budget hearing, there was nine minutes of public input on the budget. The year that we won the hearing, it lasted for over four hours and hundreds of people came out. The board took it from us the year after, but we got it back. Um, and since then we've continued to have high engagement. So we've really been able to show in a way that is undeniable that people want ownership over their money and want to be part of these, these decision-making processes. And we've gotten real community-driven expenditures in the budget too. Some have been smaller, but no less important, like a mobile crisis response team pilot program where teams of medics and crisis workers respond to emergency calls instead of law enforcement and sheriffs. And some have been larger, like $20 million for the establishment of a promise neighborhood. And in last year's budget and this year's budget, massive increases in health and human services departments like child welfare services and behavioral health services. Next slide, please. So when COVID hit, in a way we were ready. We were also kind of like, I told you so, because the systemic issues that we've been trying to bring attention to and the county's failures were made even more apparent when our region was unable to meet the needs of people impacted by COVID-19 and even unable to protect its own county workers. We pivoted quickly, kept pushing, and even last year when we still had a majority conservative board, we were able to win more than we ever had before. We won $24 million in rent relief, and that was before the state and federal government stepped in to provide support. We won $2.5 million to expand translation and interpretation services across all departments in the county. That is absolutely essential in a binational region which, with one of the most diverse populations in the country. And it's even more important when a county is responsible for communications that can be life or death like informing and supporting people during a pandemic. We won economic assistance, like with uh, 12, $2 million, excuse me, with $2 million dedicated to a COVID-19 income replacement fund, which gives stipends to workers impacted by COVID who don't have access to paid sick leave or unemployment benefits. We won an additional $2 million to expand internet access for low-income students in K through 12 education. $1 million for free tenant counseling and legal services, and $90,000 to provide free menstrual products at public locations across the county. And again, we were able to get these wins last year with a conservative board that included one supervisor who's actually still there, who publicly stated that he doesn't even believe in COVID. And our country's national climate was also different. Under our previous presidential administration, counties did not know if they would get more, fund, more funds and support from the federal government. So it was challenging, but extremely important for local governments to step up. And that was made possible here in San Diego County by the work and engagement of community members. When elected leaders know that members of the public are watching and will hold them accountable, it adds pressure and it makes change possible. And this is why we are so excited about the shift in the San Diego County Board of Supervisors that just happened in November of 2020. We have changed the conversation about the budget and brought attention to the county. And now we have a new Board of Supervisors for the first time in a long while, made up of elected officials who ran on our messaging and won. And more than that, these representatives seem to be more than just politicians, but also real leaders who've been working with us in these past few months to start to push for bigger changes. I'll share some information about the county voting process that might help explain why more allies on the board could be so important. So three votes is all that is needed to pass most county policies and budget allocations usually come with that. So if the board passes a policy in January, they only need three votes. And it, the budget that comes out later that year in May will usually automatically include funding to support that policy if funding is needed. So three votes um, is a big deal. But make no mistake, we're still up against a lot. 
The sheriff has a lot of power. He's an elected leader. And because of the law, the supervisors have a limited amount of influence, influence on decisions related to the sheriff and his budget. Some financial decisions still do require four votes. There are conservative and even delusional voices that remain on the board. And there are also limitations that come from state and federal law. But we also have an unprecedented opportunity that we helped create, that those of you who have been involved have helped to create. And we've been working really hard over the past few years to position ourselves to take advantage of this opportunity. I think a lot of us are excited and ready to fight. And if you're not yet, let me share a little bit with you all about what we've been able to do since January, just in the past few months. Oh, thank you. Uh, since the beginning of January, in less than five full months, we have already had some major wins for, at the county from working with this new board. I talked about narrative change a little bit earlier and how changing the way that people talk about things can be the start of changing the way people do things and changing the way that decisions are made. So in January, the Board of Supervisors formally acknowledged racism for the first time in San Diego history and adopted a resolution that declared racism as a public health crisis. And that is real narrative change. In that same month, they committed to an equitable COVID response. That means that whereas the previous board had been giving equal response and equal resources to all areas of the county. This board has been making sure that regions that have been more impacted by COVID are prioritized. That is not only the more logical and effective approach, but also what's been recommended by the state all along. The board also created committees dedicated to looking into some of the key issues our coalition has been highlighting, such as transparency, budgeting, and contracting. That was just January. In February, the county finally passed a family sick leave policy for county workers. We all know that county health and human service workers have been on the front lines of COVID response. This policy allows these workers who have been putting their lives on the line for our families to take paid sick leave if they need to take care of one of their own family members. In March, we were able to win a new program dedicated to providing young people with employment opportunities at the county. We also won access to free phone calls for individuals who are incarcerated in county facilities. We had been fighting for this for a while and this new board was finally willing to take this on and become one of the first counties in the nation to stop this terrible practice of profiting off of families trying to contact their loved ones. In April, there was only one meeting, but we made good use of it. We expanded the mobile crisis response team pilot program that I mentioned earlier we finally eliminated Project 100, which was a program where people enrolled in county services like CalFresh were given random surprise visits in their home. San Diego, San Diego was the only county in the entire country with this program, and we'd been trying to get rid of it for a long time. So this was a big win. We also won the creation of a new group dedicated to coming up with recommendations to get more people enrolled in county programs and the creation of a budget equity framework to start to change how county departments approach the creation of their budgets from the beginning of the process. So far in May, we have one more meeting, but just last Tuesday, we won a local eviction moratorium and a moratorium on rent increases that will provide stronger protections for renters and prohibit unnecessarily high rent increases while the emergency order is in place. We won the creation of an immigrant rights legal defense program, which will provide free legal representation to individuals facing deportation, and the creation of an Office of Labor Standards Enforcement, which means the county will finally start to establish one central office dedicated to protecting and enforcing the rights of working people. Again, these are all things we have won just from January of this year to now. Next slide, please. Um, and so we've won those things from January until now, and there's still a lot more opportunity and a lot more to be done. The county just released, released its first draft of the budget for the next fiscal year last week on May 6th. Between now and June 29th, the County Board of Supervisors will be reviewing and evaluating the budget, listening to public input, and submitting changes to the proposed budget. 
So right now there is an important window of opportunity to continue advocating for your community priorities to be represented in this year's budget. And please remember the county budget is made up of public dollars. This is your money and you have every right to push elected leaders to make sure your needs are included. Thank you all for your time and I'm gonna pass it back to Ariana now. Thank you, Angelina. Can we just give a big shout out to Angelina for breaking down everything? Um, so we are actually going to our next poll question. Um, we're actually gonna be going back to Menti because we wanna see where everyone is at after hearing you know, about the history of the county, where we're at, um, where we've been, uh, where we're going, about the future. We want to know about your top three priorities for the County of San Diego. So again, um, on the screen, you will see the QR code. If you um, put up your phone, you'll be able to um, use that to go to the website menti.com using the code 70577430. And it will provide you with different options to choose from. Let me actually link it down in the chat. And if you're not able to access that, please feel free to share it on the chat. So we, we're seeing it grow. Let me pull it up. So as folks start uh, putting in their top priorities, it, it does change. So we see that a lot of folks care about affordable housing. So that's very important, right? Um, redefining public safety. So identifying like how we see public safety services for immigrant communities. So that was a big win um, this past two weeks. Tenant protections, you know, how is it that we make sure that we are protecting our families and renters, especially during the times of COVID. Higher wages, worker safety and protection, youth opportunities and jobs. And if you're not able to access Menti, feel free to sh um, share in the chat. I think that is it. Um, so a lot of these priorities are priorities that we are prioritizing this year um, and we have prioritized in the past with ISDF for investing in San Diego families. Um, we will continue to um, keep in contact with all of you to see um, what are the different opportunities that you can all take to take action. There are some simple ones. There are some ones where we do need um, folks to call in. Um, so please, um, Please stay um, for the rest of the meeting and then Blair will actually be going into an action. But thank you all for sharing. Um, Jeff did mention rent increase no more. Uh, Missy, after school care, child care. Child care is very important. Um, youth employment and enrichment opportunities. You know, how is it that we're providing um, opportunities for young people to like grow and thrive in the communities that they live? Um, raise wages, 15. Um, the, you know, the housing, um, housing issue is because a lot of folks don't get paid um, enough to pay rent or even pay a mortgage. Um, so housing is a big issue that we are seeing. And I think we're going to go ahead and transition back to Judy, um, but thank you all for sharing.
Can I, uh, I'm going to hop in here real quick. Um, we want to really honor, I want to first thank our captioner, Jesse, who's been doing the captioning for us right now. And also Andrea, who's been doing the translation in order to honor uh, the break that Jesse needs. Um, I think if we could spend a couple of more minutes, like when we think about this, you know, I appreciate Jeff, like you putting into the chat, um, you know, what do these categories mean? So maybe in the chat for you, like what are some policies inside of this that you wanna see your, your dollars go to or policies that you wanna see the county do? Check it out in the chat. What do these blocks mean? What could it turn into? I, I want to chime in really quick um, for the redefining public safety. I'm really curious about creative ways we can go about addressing this. And I haven't followed up on this story since um, it happened, I think last year, but the the county in Los Angeles, the county supervisors over there, they, um, I believe they just proposed um, a policy change for their sheriff. I don't know if anyone is familiar with that, but the sheriff is an elected official here in San Diego. And I guess there's a way to change like the, the I don't know if it's, I don't know the words, but the bylaws for being a, a sheriff, it, um, if we could switch it from being an elected position to being an appointed position. I'm really curious about that one. Um, I don't know if that has officially been done in LA, but I know there, I know that's been um, discussed at their county. So I'm wondering if that's also something that we could eventually um, look more into. And since uh, the affordable housing came up as number one for everyone, including myself, um, definitely follow ACE. If you don't follow ACE already, um, our community partners, I can also drop um, their info in the chat as well, but um, they focus on housing and, and tenants' rights, um, and they're a badass group of people <laughs> led by a badass woman, Grace, and so I will, I'll drop their info in here too if, if um, some of you um, care deeply about the housing issue. Thank you so much. I am going to move on to the uh, next slide because I think there's a lot of, oh, great, Jesse, so good to have you back. Thank you so much for, um, you know, checking in and making sure that we're getting what we need. So I'm going to turn on my video so y'all can see my face. Hello, humans. Um, thank you for everybody for, um, as I'm running the presentations, I'm going to go back here and go to our current slide. Uh, All right, so what do you need to know about future dates? So it's really important to push the county supervisors and this is where we talk to, we're gonna talk about how can you influence. You have a lot of information now, you know the problems that exist in your community and you know the solutions. We have the solutions. Each of us as individuals have creative ideas, and passion and care um, that's so obvious in this chat and that I know all of us as individuals have. Um, and I wanna just shout out again back to Angelina, you have every right and responsibility to advocate for where you wanna see that money go to um, change those things. They are elected officials and it's important that we remember that we work in tandem with them, that we, if they wanna know what's best for the county, we need to let them know that and also hold them accountable and, and bring them the things that we need. So wanna show you some dates that are coming up. So, and this will be a kind of place where I'm gonna walk us through over the next few, uh, you know, little bit of time is just some understanding about kind of where there are places for you to be able to step in. So first I just wanna show you some dates. And again, these slides will be sent to you. But if you want to take a picture, you can. Uh, we have Board of Supervisors meetings are typically on Tuesdays. They meet about every two weeks, but sometimes the schedule changes. But all of that's available online, um, which we will take you to that website. And our next uh, BOS meeting, Board of Supervisors meeting, 
is um, uh, May 18th. So May 18th is our next BOS meeting. Then June 3rd is our next training. So in our next training, we will go, tonight we're gonna to talk about like e-comments, how to make comments for these BOS meetings. But on uh, the following training, we'll be talking more about like, how do you talk about your story and you know, thinking about you know, uh, specific policies or even just you know, lobbying and those kinds of things that give you a lot more information and training. And we'll be doing breakout rooms too, where you can practice. So um, I encourage you to put that on, the, um, on your calendar and someone else can drop in the chat again. If you haven't registered for the June 3rd training, please do that now and maybe send to a couple of friends like, hey, I'm in this training, it's going great. You should sign up for the second one with me. So if someone can drop that in the chat. Then our next uh, BOS meeting is June 8th. Again, they're always on Tuesdays. So just, it's always great to kind of get that into your head. And then on June 10th, we as ISDF will be hosting a lobby day. We're, that's a day where we will have about 45 minutes with each of the supervisors, except for the ones that don't wanna meet with us. Um, and <laughs> that's only one, I bet you can guess who. And uh, we are uh, going to talk to those folks about what we need and uh, have a lot of, lot of individuals from the community come in and be able to interact with their supervisor. It's really important that this not just be calling in or talking on the phone and being this like faceless voice. This is a chance for them to see you and a chance for you to see them. And to really see one of the things I really love, one of our coworkers who's a, a great organizer, Jean Wee Tran, um, said like, they're just like us. And people get really nervous about going in to visit their, per, their supervisor. And they're just like us, they're just people. And so it's a great chance for you and any other folks you think would wanna share their stories or at least be able to hear from the supervisor about what they're committed to as far as the ISDF values, it's a really great opportunity. So that's June 10th. And then June 16th is a huge night for us also for mobilizing where we want a bunch of people to come out to hear about, um, about some of the, uh, about what the budget is gonna look like. So the budget just got dropped last Thursday. And so what happens, I won't get into all the details, but what happens is uh, this, the, um, we have that budget and then each of the supervisors proposes different changes they want to make to the budget before they have final deliberations on June 29th. So that period between May 6th and June 29th is a period where we can make advocacy with those folks for them to make changes to that budget so that it reflects what we need. So just to give you that context, and usually we have to get them those, we want to make sure that that happens by June 16th, which is the last sort of budget hearing for the public. Um, and it's like our last opportunity to like really hear what's going on and, and make our efforts known. So put June 16th also on your calendar and uh, get ready for that. So we're going to talk about some specific things you can do, but I'm going to turn it over to Ariana to have us do some brainstorming together uh, about ways that we can advocate. Are we moving forward with the action? Oh, we were gonna do uh, the question. Thanks y'all. Oh, I didn't switch to Spanish either. So there it is. So we had a question that we wanted to throw into the chat because I know like I just gave you a bunch of things about like how to call in, but you know, we want you to really think about like what power do you have to make county change? What is the power that you hold and maybe this is like a really broad question, but that's because we know we have super creative people in here um, who have lots of ways that we, that can see like what power it is that we hold and how we can use that power. So I encourage you in the chat, because I know there's like a lot of folks who've taken action before. And even if you haven't taken action before, what do you feel like is the power that you hold and how can you use it? So we already said you can call in. What else can we do? 
And Ariana, I think you might have some other things too. Yeah, so Blair did talk about lobbying. Lobbying is very important. Voting power is super important. This is how we got a new board. Um, emailing our supervisors and representatives, making sure that they know what our priorities. We can speak up, we can make sure they hear us. Definitely, there's so many ways that folks can get involved, if that's calling in, if that's showing up at a meeting, um, if that's directly calling them, just picking up the phone. Sharing with our friends on why budgets are important. So a lot of folks, you know, I feel like a lot of our friends or family members feel really frustrated about the outcomes, but um, we also need to um, be able to share with them and have them understand, walk them through understanding like the budget and how that process looks like so that they can also feel empowered to, you know, speak up and really share what are they prioritizing. So mobilizing leaders from community and faith institutions. So there's a lot of power when folks come together um, to really move um, with things that they care, things and issues that they care about. So Judy mentioned um, the power of storytelling and I agree, I think personal stories are so important to share when calling and writing in. So that's something that Whitney shared with us. Um, and I appreciate that. Um, I think a lot of the times we, we provide like data, statistics, which is beautiful because you there, you know, there's an understanding of what's happening. However, with each data, which each statistic that is given, there's always a story that is, um, you know, that is shared behind that data statistic. Um, that's something that I've always learned from Imani, who is our research person, person um, educating people on voting. So integrated voter engagement, you know, why do we vote? Like, what is the importance of voting? How is it that we can utilize voting to empower communities, but really hold our elected officials accountable? A lot of people don't realize that our taxes um, make up the budgets. So this money is not coming out of thin air. Uh, this is money that we are investing in. So we, we should have a say in how um, we are reinvesting or investing. It's literally our money, period. Yeah, so there's a lot of good comments. Thank you all for sharing. Um, I think all of you have really tapped into the many layers of how we can get involved ourselves and how we can motivate, motivate other folks to get involved. Yes, thank you so much, everybody. Um, so we're gonna take action right now. So first I do wanna, like I always, we're in these Zooms all the time and we're kind of floating heads. And so I do, we've been sitting here together or standing or laying whatever you're doing for an hour. And so just invite you to take a second to stretch and feel your body and be here. Cause we're about to transition into doing some, taking some action and you know building that power, using that power. So uh, I really, uh, again, just want to remind us all, we've got, you know, 37 people here on this call and, you know, we've, we've had more than that. You know, I know people, some people have to dip early um, here and then all of our ISDF coalition partners and community members all over San Diego County who are advocating for these things. So just want to remind us that we're part of this much bigger movement to change San Diego and, and uh, get our county what we need. So uh, we're gonna take action right now. So I'm gonna switch over and I'm gonna ask my folks in the chat to just help me with sharing the links. Oops, there we go. So I'm gonna first show you the instructions and then I'm actually gonna walk you through it uh, on the screen. So first I'm just gonna kind of explain a little bit to you and then I'll show you how it works. And folks will be dropping in the uh, chat the links that you'll need to follow along. So we're going to ask you to make an e-comment right now. So first, I just want to say, what's an e-comment? <laughs> I mean, it seems pretty obvious, right? Is that you get to go online. There are multiple ways you can influence people for an upcoming, influence supervisors for an upcoming uh, budget, or excuse me, upcoming meeting. You can send them emails directly to them at their at their district or at their um, at their email, which is on the County Board of Supervisors page, which will be dropped in the chat. And if you don't know who your supervisor is, 
now's a good time for you to look. We, we will drop into the chat like how to find who your supervisor is. Because one of the other things um, you know, that we think about is what is gonna be influential? And as we talked about stories are really important, it's also really important to let your supervisor know that you are from their district and that you are paying attention. Now that doesn't mean you can't advocate for things to supervisors that aren't part of your district. You're part of the county. But it does mean a lot to supervisors when they know that people from their district care about these things and are showing up. So it's always great to um, strategically uh, include your district uh, when you want your supervisor to do you know, what, what works for you. So e-commerce can influence supervisors because they see the community input before the meeting. So you can have, you can send emails directly to them, but there's also a way through the county website to submit an e-comment. And then you can of course get register to speak at the um, BOS meeting, Board of Supervisors meeting, and you can call in at the time of the meeting. But e-comments and emails are great because they happen before they get into that room. And so they already know where their constituents are. And it's super easy too. Sometimes sitting in Board of Supervisors meetings can be a long thing and we all are, you know, have different lives. And so this is a great way for you to make your voice known uh, without having to maybe do all that same kind of scheduling. So, so here it is in Spanish too. Apologies for not switching sooner. I'm going to ask you to go to the BOS agenda and e-comments page. So that's, that's, we're going to drop that in the chat again. And again, I'm giving you some process information. Usually the agenda for the Tuesday meeting is finalized and the e-comments open when that agenda is finalized on the Thursday before the Tuesday BOS meeting. So today's Thursday, so this worked out beautifully. Now you're gonna click the agenda item that you would like to comment on. Tonight, today, because there are no specific ISDF um, priorities that are coming as board letters on Tuesday, we're asking y'all to take action in non-agenda public comment. And what non-agenda public comment is, is usually at the beginning of a meeting where you can come tell the supervisors about anything that you want them to prioritize. You can let them know. And usually it's between one and two minutes when you like call in. Um, but in this case, you can just let them know things that you want and uh, do that in non-agenda public item or non-agenda public comment. Oh, I said it right. And uh, and then, but you'll see the numbers. So in the future, when there are certain items that you want to speak on, you will just click on that one and then be able to comment there. So in this case, we're going to ask you to go down to non-agenda public uh, comment and click there. And then you're going to type your comment. And we have a little uh, blurb that we did for you uh, to just give you a sample. But as we've said before, the more personal you can make it, the better. You don't have to include what we say, but it would be great for you to be able to lift up what district you're in, that you attended this ISDF event, and, uh, and what it is that you really want to see in those budgets. So uh, Josh or someone will drop into the chat that little blurb for you. And so the questions we usually ask is, you know, what district you're in, what do you want the supervisor to do? And how will it affect your life and the lives of the people that are important to you, that you care about? Those are really, really key. And I know in our um, efforts for getting free phone calls, the stories that people gave about not only how it had affected them, you know, how it really had impacted their lives negatively, but also what it could do for them and their families to have this policy in place. So I'm gonna escape out of here so I can actually do a little screen sharing, make sure you can see this really well. If you're a visual learner, we all have different modalities. So this is the, um, what you should see when you come to that page. And here's where, if you wanna know what's going on, you click on the agenda and you'll just get this PDF that walks you through uh, what all is on the agenda. And I will let you know that at the meetings, sometimes these will be out of order. 
So you kind of have to, if you're there at the beginning, they'll sort of tell you what the reorder is. And if you're working with us, one of the great things that we do, if you're planning on calling in, is we'll let you know like, hey, this agenda is coming up around this time so that you can schedule. You might even be on a text thread that tells you when to call in. So it's really fun and we get to all be a part of it. And then you click on e-comment if you wanna comment on something. In this case, click non-agenda public communication, as they say, and you put in the information here. So you can um, sign in or you can put your name. I encourage you to you, uh, at least put your name, your email address and your zip code uh, in order to do that. For non-agenda public comment, you know, you're sort of neutral <laughs> at this point, but when there's an agenda item that you want to support, or oppose, this is a great place for you to be able to like click that. And I encourage you to really make sure you do that because it makes it a really easy visual. I'll give you an example. We just had this really great example of how e-comments did a lot of work for us. Um, was we, uh, the, the uh, Tara Lawson Remmer's office brought forward an immigration defense fund to make sure that there was legal representation for those who might be deported. And they let us know about that on Monday. They had a great press conference. And Tuesday, you know, did that Tuesday. And then by Thursday, there was already a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment that was coming up. And so we started seeing those things in the news. And, you know, because we allied with the supervisor too, like they let us know that that was coming through. And so we organized, particularly uh, San Diego Organizing Project and ACLU and a lot of our partners, please shout out in the chat if your org did some organizing around this, um, to really flood the e-comments. And we had hundreds of people write in in support of this office. And so what it meant was, was that instead of you like scanning through and seeing like oppose, 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 you saw support, 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 support. So it was incredibly beautiful and they do have to read them as Judy said, and it makes sure that they're thinking about these things before they go into the meeting and seeing that there's that support or anger or frustration or whatever are the things that people are feeling and what the people in the district want. And so then you just, you know, type in your beautiful words however you like. And again, we encourage you to include your district, include your, your story and how, what you want them to do. And then, um, you know, we would love for you to use today to talk about ISDF. So I'm going to stop there for a second and make sure that every, see how we're doing. Has everybody made any comments? Once you've done it, throw into the chat that you've done that. But we do want to um, use this opportunity to build community power to influence the policies that help San Diego families. And the way that we can do that is by sharing and inviting others to join us. Individuals, it's great, like one person can make a huge difference, but when we ally together and work together, we can accomplish so much. And ISDF has already like had that momentum. And so get on the bus, right? We are moving forward. We are bringing these, what seems like common values to y'all. Um, come join us and get your friends to join us. And, and join us can mean, as we're, as Jessica put into the chat here, go to our Instagram, our Facebook, our Twitter. Like those aren't always the best way to always like influence directly the decision makers. But what it does do is raise awareness countywide so everyone can pay attention to those budgets. And we also have great graphics from Jessica who's throwing those things in the chat and other folks. Thank, big thanks to Sophia from Youth Will this week that's also been helping with all the great graphics that you may have seen. So we're gonna ask you right now to take two actions. Two, one, go to our those three places if you use any of those and go ahead and like us if you haven't yet. Maybe this will be good to type in the chat too. And then number two, we'd love for you to share the flyer for these, these trainings and share, this is something that I learned at this training tonight. Please register now to join me on June 3rd. So like us and then share the flyer 
asking people to register now and follow, also follow ISDF. So I'm gonna let us all like get to whatever, cause it's 6.50, we've got some time um, and play a little music while we uh, do all these actions. It's, I always feel really gratified at the end of a webinar or something like that when I feel like, okay, that's a great information, but what do I do? And now we're getting to do multiple things. So I'm gonna um, share the music and you can ask questions in the chat um, and just we'll kind of like work on our phones and on our computers to take these actions together right now. Thank you. 